Hello and welcome back to the Hyperthesis. We are now on the episode 19. My name is Feely. I'm Patrick. And I'm Liam. Alright, so today we have a really fun main topic, at least for us, because we realized that the Nobel Prize was announced this year. Uh, it's going to be a little while ago, but a week or two ago. So we're going to be discussing the nooks and cranny and you know how that works and why it's so important and exciting that about this year's Nobel Prize. But before that, let's check up with the rest of us, is there any new things or exciting things that's happened this past week? Uh, I, I have a new thing that I just learned about. It's certainly not new in terms of time, but uh, I was listening to a very interesting podcast on the myths uh, surrounding Galileo, including his seemingly martyrdom as a scientist against the church and uh, just go, delving into his life and what most likely actually happened with them versus what people perceived to happen with them. And the interesting fact I learned is that he wasn't the first by far to invent the telescope. So Galileo has been known, and at least we're taught in school, that he invented the telescope and then observed the heavens, uh, made notes about the moons of Jupiter and the moon and all these different nearby astronomical phenomena but he only improved the telescope now mind you he does deserve a lot of credit for improving the telescope and working on it but the first inventor of the telescope was actually denied their patent for it because they were already common and they were seen as okay anyone can make this and you can't really patent something that everyone has already had access to for many years And that was even before Galileo had heard of telescopes. Now, around this time in the 1600s in Europe, uh, this notion of telescopes moved relatively quickly. And at one point, a Dutch person was going to display the telescope to um, essentially the the ruler of that city-state in Italy where Galileo is from, which was centered around Venice. Uh, Galileo pulled some strings invented his own own telescope after never having seen one, and then showed it to the ruler of the Venice city-state itself, uh, and now today is known as the misconception that he invented the, the telescope. So that was something very interesting to hear, uh, and if you want to hear more about that, there's a great podcast called Our Fake History, uh, which has, I think, a three-part um, series just on the life of Galileo. Well, sometimes the inventor is not the the most known by the from the invention, right? Like the most of the time that happened in history is more like who popularized it. And then uh, you can see a lot with these uh I don't know like uh, video challenges and all these stuff that people young people got into these days or even co- video content in general. They're not but per se original, it's really hard to track who who is who invented it. But people n- know whoever popularized it, right? Yeah. Another thing is often the person credited with inventing it wasn't the first person to have the idea. They're just the first person to come up with a good working version of the idea, maybe. I find that a lot. And a lot of the stories we've told in past episodes, that seems to be the thing where They weren't the first person to have this idea, but they made the first, like, popularized version of it. Yeah, it's interesting to see the differences, especially between, like, patents in science versus regular patents, because a lot of the times, if you publish something and you're the first to publish it, that's attributed to you, and then people can build on your ideas, whereas with patents, it's kind of a dog-eat-dog world, which is, uh, does overlap with science a lot. Uh, There are a lot of people, especially in say, condensed matter or within, like, computational fields of physics that have patents because they have these ideas to make better instruments and whatnot. So it's interesting to see. And I think it was described well 
is that it's not who does it first, it's who does it best, and who does it with flair and style. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point about who does it best. Yeah, but I think there's some, some ideas just deserve recognition just because their creativity itself you know, is, is sometimes really hard to come up with something that works well, like Liam said, is the, in the first iteration, right? Like the prototype is usually bad, it's usually terrible, but the idea is there. And sometimes in, on rare occasion, the same pe- person who invented it just improved on the design. If you think of some company like Dyson, right? Like Dyson, he came up with a way to make vacuum work really well. And he's and is still one of the best in the market right now. He, I think he went to thousands of design. I watched his interview. It was just like, you know, when you first came up with the first prototype, that this idea is so creative in vacuum um, system. And then he's keep improving on that where nobody else could have done it better at the time. So I think there are people who make really, really creative original idea that imp- that can be improved on by themselves that uh, work really well. But there are also people who come up with a lot of creative ideas, maybe 10 of them, right? Maybe they're all original and crude, but they, they don't have the sophisticated um, design or they don't on- optimize it to be the best design, but they have a lot of them. That's also kind of related to um, our main topic today in the Nobel Prize, um, how in experimental physics and, well, just physics in general, you know, someone puts a theory forward, some experimental people test it, they find that they find a couple loopholes, some other person maybe fixes the loopholes, and eventually you get a really good experiment. And that's kind of what happened for this year's uh, physics Nobel Prize. Yeah, the, the more obvious one is machine learning. It's like, you know, the only thing that, that you know, the, the sm- small piece of code is the most important is the backpropagation, which is an algorithm of how to tr- train artificial in- intelligence. That's what machine learning comes around. But whoever came up with that came up like a while ago. But all people right now doing research is to use that same thing and try to find a better version of it. But, you know, we don't talk much about the inventor of machine learning, do we? Like, you know, there are big companies that have made millions iterations of, of improvement. I think the whole feel is that. So I'm excited to see at one day if there would be a, basically a step up, a jump, instead of this gradual increment in, 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 when, in improvements. So let's see how that goes. So, with that, we should move into our main topic. Thank you, Patrick, for the little news we have. Um, so, today, if you have heard, is that um, a while ago, the Nobel Prize was announced for all the fields. And for physics, it's, it's, it's not puzzling, but yeah, you know, when oh, I'm a theorist, so when experimentalists got Nobel Prize, like, ah, oh, okay. Because the concept this year is on quantum entanglement. And quantum entanglement has been around for a while, at least the theory of it. But the experiment that won the Nobel Prize was actually uh, a more definitive. So this experiment is kind of a definitive proof of the nature of quantum entanglement. So we'll get into the ideas of the hidden local variables and you know what people believe the nature of things are or were before quantum mechanics came along and why this weird idea in quantum mechanics that's quite counterintuitive to a lot of people became known as the how the nature works, at least in measurement and in quantum level. So anyone want to jump in? Yeah, so first off, what was the yeah, so so the the Royal Swedish Academy presented the 2022 Nobel Prize in Physics to the three physicists uh Alan Aspect, John F. uh Clausier, I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong. Um Clausier, I guess. And Anton Zellinger. 
in quotation marks, for experiments with entangled photons, establishing the violation of Bell inequalities, and pioneering quantum information science. So we'll, we'll explain what that means um, for the rest of this episode. So essentially, these, these physicists, like Feely said, they conducted experiments, and they did this by using entangled quantum states. Um, but again, we'll, we'll explain what this means and the importance of it. But first, we, we kind of need to talk about some fundamental properties of quantum mechanics, some very weird properties. Um, so although our main topic's focusing on the Nobel Prize, there's also a lot of good quantum mechanics stuff in here. So to start, um, what does deterministic mean? So deterministic means is that things are kind of determined by their initial condition. So if I have like a soccer ball and I kick it, if you know its initial position and initial velocity, um, you can solve Newton's second law, F equals MA, and you can completely determine its trajectory and where it will end up at a given time. And of course, realistically, there's like a bunch of little small things to take into account, like friction and drag and all that stuff. But if you take those into account, you can theoretically exactly predict the trajectory of this ball. Um, and again, there's also things called chaotic systems, where you cannot predict things due to very sensitive um, sensitivity to initial conditions. However, those usually involve many different particles or multiple things interacting with one another. So like, weather is chaotic and that's why you can't really predict it on the short term scale yeah i think i would go further and say so say like any any system that is non-linear whatever that means mm. to people has has a chaotic element into it it's, it's really hard to get away from chaos when when you don't have a pretty nice simple system right if you think of double pendulum that's kind of like simple but you know, it's not, right? The description yeah. of some system that looks simple are really complicated. Double pendulum's the classic example of a chaotic system. So it's like a, a pendulum hanging on another pendulum. Um, but basically, classically, the universe is deterministic. And what this Nobel Prize work did is kind of say, well, quantum mechanically, it's not. Um, so quantum mechanics is kind of our improved theory upon of, of Newton's laws, and you need to describe small things. And, and basically what it does is it takes into account the discretized nature of the universe. So, so things come in small chunks and aren't continuous. So energy is quantized or discretized, position is discretized, and so on. Nothing is continuous if you zoom in on it close enough. And the quantum version of Newton's second law, so F equals MA, which a lot of people have seen in high school, is the Schrodinger equation. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's different, though, than Newton's law. So instead of telling you, if you have some particle, like a like, you know, quantum soccer ball and you kick it, instead of, if you know its initial position and initial velocity, it will not determine this, it, it won't, it's not deterministic, I guess. It won't tell you exactly where that particle is going to be it, it's all based on probability it'll tell you a specific kind of region where the particle could be with a certain probability at each point and from there um you can determine when, when when you measure it's the act of measuring in quantum mechanics well what, what they call collapse it'll collapse that system to a specific point so if you kick your quantum soccer ball you get some kind of spread out region of probabilities and when you measure it you look at it you interact with it it then collapses to a single point and you find your quantum soccer ball there but it's not it's non-deterministic i still see quantum as deterministic but what is deterministic is not the values or what's called expectation values is the wave function is deterministic i mean the probability is deterministic we know the probability really well but we just don't know if it's going to happen, like, really. But we know, you know, probability is pretty clear. It's non-deterministic in the sense that you don't know exactly pinpoint where your kind of quantum particle will be. You just know it's somewhere in this region according to the wave function. So, um, another property 
we I want to just quickly touch on is the principle of superposition. So if you kick this quantum soccer ball um, along its quantum probabilistic trajectories, um, I'm not quite sure how to word this, but the specific famous example is Schrodinger's cat, which is kind of a bad example because it sweeps a lot under the rug, but I'll say it anyway. Schrodinger's cat is basically you seal a cat inside of a box. Um, you don't you you didn't look at the cat, so you don't know if it's what state it's in. It could be dead, it could be alive. Those are the two states we're going to consider. And inside this box, there's a single quantum particle. And if this particle ends up in one state, the cat will die through some mechanism we will ignore for now. And if the particle ends up in another state, the cat will live. And essentially what happens is that because of the superposition principle, this quantum particle is actually in both states. And again, I'm skipping a ton of details here, but it's in two states at once. It's not just in one or the other. And the act of measuring it collapses it to one of the states. And that will, the idea is that the cat is actually both dead and alive until you look at it. Well, I, I put some more practicality into it. So if you put cat in a box, right? And you put it with a radio radioactive material, which has 50% chance of emitting the deathly ray. Right? If you put it in the box, because it's radioactive, you don't know when it's going to pop out or if it's going to pop out at all, you know? So if you close the box, how do you know if the cat's dead or alive? You can't. So instead of saying, well, we, we can say that there's a 50% chance that cat's dead and 50% chance the cat's alive, right? But we know that. That's what we know for sure. But we, what we don't know is that state at this precise moment. And the only way to know is to open the box or find some way to measure something inside the box. And that's, that's the point of this thought experiment to say that, well, instead of thinking thing as black and white, right, there is this gray area that is like, if we don't know, let's just say that they both happen at the same time. So there's super, the superposition is about that. You know, that it's possible for either scenario to happen. So logically, just think it as it happened in this mathematical function or object and then once we do something to that math mathematical object it determines the actual outcome and that's basically the well one of the best um backbone of quantum mechanics yeah and it's it's like this weird thing that we don't even fully really understand because it goes against our classical intuition it's like clearly when i look at a cat it's dead or alive it's not both but in the quantum world, things are very strange. And again, ma mathematically, this is, it's nice. Be this happens because um, any solution of the Schrod any any kind of sum is what we call linear, any sum of solutions of the Schrodinger equation is itself a solution. So for all the physics people out there, you'll hear the term linear combination thrown around a lot. Um, but, but the point is, is that quantum mechanics does kind of weird and funny things, which are very counterintuitive to our classical way of thinking. Um, and we, we know it we know it behaves weird, but we know it works through tons of experiments and through tons of successful predictions of nature. It's just we don't really kind of understand what's happening on a deep, deep level. So we're 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 starting to approach the Nobel Prize stuff instead of just kind of this weird abstract quantum mechanics stuff. <coughs> Excuse me. So quantum mechanics, <coughs> sorry, quantum mechanics also does this thing. It allows for the existence of what's called an entangled state. So to summarize, an entangled state is basically you can create, say, two particles nearby each other, and they're entangled in the sense that if you do something to one particle, it affects the other particle. And what actually happens is that no matter how far apart they are, this is true. So, so one of our old undergraduate profs used this, uh, this mitten analogy, or this glove analogy, to describe this. So imagine you have um, a pair of gloves. One's left-handed and one's right-handed. 
and you get your friend to put one of them in a box and gives the box to you, and then he puts the remaining one in a different box and ships it to the other side of the world. You, once it's re reached the other side of the world, you then open the box that he gave you, and you find that, say, the mitten is right-handed. You immediately know that the mitten on the other side of the world is left-handed. And that's, I mean, that seems pretty obvious, but that's kind of what's happening in um, Entanglement, very, very fast and loosely, is that you have two particles, you create them in some way, they're entangled, um, <clears throat> you send one of them across the universe, and if you measure the state of the one that you kept, you instantaneously know the state of the other one across the universe. And at first that might seem obvious, but it's this very deep, weird thing. Well, I think that example is actually different from what I imagined, because I actually explained this concept of hidden local variables before in, in one of, no, not this podcast. Yeah, I was coming but to that. The, yeah, the example you just said what was the example of the old thinking of hidden local variables, right? We, you know exactly, you have the pair left and right in the box, but this Nobel Prize, the, what was about this is to basically break that, um, that thinking that, you know, we know exactly the two things in a box. Instead, we have, well, I think Liam's going to get to that. Yeah, so Einstein was a big believer um, that things were deterministic. He did not like the idea that God played dice, as he said. Things shouldn't be random. The EPR paradox. Einstein, um, Poldovsky, and Rosen, I believe. This this EPR paradox came from this kind of quantum entanglement idea that if you have these two particles, you spread them out, you measure one, the state of one, you know the state of the other. The idea is that somehow these things are violating causality. Somehow the information on one, when, uh, of one is affecting the other instantaneously in some way and Einstein did not like that idea so he came up with this idea of local of local hidden variables whereas that when these two particles were initially produced and entangled there's some some process going on which we can't see hence the name hidden variable or there, there's hidden variables which are kind of letting these particles talk to one another so somehow when they're produced one of them says all right if you if, if we go this way and I measure to be in this state, then you have to be in this state or so on. And what's really interesting is it's not just the state they're in, but the way they're measured is also affected and transmitted over these huge distances instantaneously. And that's the super weird part for me is not only is if you measure one particle in one state, you know the state of the far away particle. If you measure it a specific way, the way you measure it actually affects the state of the particle across the universe. So Einstein did not like this idea at all, and he tried this kind of local hidden variable theory to um, describe it. So the physicist John Bell um, came up with this inequality, or this theorem, back in, uh, it was 1964, I believe. He came up with the famous Bell inequality, which he, he came up with this mathematical inequality that says, if this thing is violated, then local hidden variable theories are not good. They fail. And then, so maybe, yeah. Yeah, it's just a statistical thing, right? So basically, he basically quantifies that the maximum statistical correlation that can happen if there are hidden local variables. So if the system knows a bunch of things that we don't, there are statistical probability, uh, or statistical stuff that you can calculate that one should be less than the other. So that's a simple explanation, I guess. So the, what happened in Nobel Prize, that if you can find these statistics that violate that, so maybe what you think is less than the other object is actually bigger, then the local hidden variables cannot happen. It's actually a very definitive um, theory on a theorem on like, well, if local hidden variables are true, this inequality must also be true. So since that inequality is, is violated, the local hidden variables doesn't look like a great option after all. Yeah, so, so because 
So, so this theorem that Bell came up with, if it's violated, then the universe is determined, or how do I word this? If, if it's not violated, then the universe is deterministic and this local hidden variable theory by Einstein and so on works. But if it's not violated, then the universe is truly random and quantum mechanics wins. And that's exactly what the Nobel Prize by um, Alain Aspect, John Clausier, and Anton Zellinger did for experiments with entangled phone, uh, photons. And they showed that Bell's inequality held. And therefore, it turns out Einstein's intuition that local hidden variable theories exist was wrong. A rare occurrence that Einstein is wrong about something. Wait, uh, the Bell's inequality, inequality didn't hold. That's oh, okay, the, I got it, it violates backward. Bell inequality. Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah, because, same idea. Because if there are local hidden variables, I think um, you can calculate the, the statistical correlation pretty well. Uh, it's, it's gonna be lower, I think, or something. I don't yeah, <laughs> you're, you're right. Yeah. It it was violated. So Bell inequality being violated means EPR um, fails. So Einstein was wrong, and that quantum mechanics is probabilistic, not deterministic. So this doesn't like it may not seem like a huge deal, but that's a really big deal. That's many people call this thing the most profound discovery in science. I, I I don't even fully grasp why it's such a big deal, um, but it's very against our classical way of thinking. Again, it's very hard to imagine. You know, you kick a ball, you know where it's going to go, and then suddenly it doesn't go there. It's it's not intuitive. Um, so like we were talking about in our introduction, um, what actually happened? So John Clausier he developed he took Bell's ideas, um, that which were written in a publication in 1964, and he created a practical experiment, which actually showed that Bell's inequality was violated and that um, local hidden variable theories are not true. However, there were some small loopholes, um, and John uh, Clausier, uh, in his experiment, so Alain uh, Aspect um, further developed this setup and closed this loophole. <clears throat> So he was basically able to switch the measurements in this experiment so that um, he made the measurements after the entangled pair have let, had left their source, which seems like a big deal. Seems very important in the experimental setup. So basically, there, Anton Zellinger, he then used these entangled states. Um, he used these entangled states with his research group to demonstrate something called quantum teleportation, which I actually don't know very much about. Um, but it's a phenomenon that makes it possible to move a quantum state from one particle to another at a great distance. So all three of them together, one of them started the experiment, there were some loopholes, the second one refined it, the third one came along and showed that you can use it for something. Um, so it's a pretty big deal, and I'll, a lot of this stuff has applications, actually, although I don't fully understand how, but applications in like quantum information, quantum computing, quantum cryptography, which we actually did an episode on um, at some point. Yeah, the transfer in quantum state, a quantum tele teleportation is super important. Because like, for, especially for quantum computing, I think we did this too, Liam, during our undergrad in the quantum circuits, because uh, the computer has to transfer state to one another. If you think of classical computer, right? If you want to move data from RAM to CPU or something, you just move that one zero or zero one around. So if you can transfer a quantum state from one place to another, right, you can use that as to transfer information. So that's how quantum computing comes along if you have a way to transfer quantum state. And when you learn about quantum computing, you learn about a bunch of gates and stuff. And what it does is basically an operator acting on the quantum state to basically transfer. Well, some of them acts like a transfer from one for, transfer of, of a state from one element or one particle to another. So I think this is very revolutionary in terms of what they did here. Right? Like, and, but entanglement to me is a little bit different. Entanglement is really difficult to create and and I think even more difficult to maintain. 
and the fact that they were able to create an entanglement and put it far apart and measure it, and then you have to be careful about how you measure it. Uh, how can you be sure the other one is not affected, and how can we, are you be sure that um, you know causality? How does that work? Um, is are is everything simultaneous or are do they take time to um create other state or to measure the other state? How you make sure things happen instantaneously? There are a lot of experimental tricks and techniques to make that happen. Yeah, and that's one of the downsides of Nobel prizes is that they greatly oversimplify things. They say three people did this. But in reality, there's probably been hundreds of scientists and grad students and so on that made this happen. But it's also a good thing because you're giving these really good scientists credit for their really good work. Um, but yeah, it's it's a feat in its own, even like measuring these things, let alone proving Bell's inequality. I mean, it used to be easier to discern truth out of experiments right like when Millikan do his oil drop so when Millikan did his oil drop is pretty straightforward uh repeatable uh, it's very basically almost like definition of science right it's kind of simpler things to do but now we want to measure mass of not just electrons right the quarks they are things that are really difficult to do by oneself so the team has to come up with a way to do it. So awarding to one person is kind of, you know, reductive a little, a little bit. But, you know, it's nice to recognize the head of the team, the one who developed it or invent the thing. So a sad note about this was that John Bell, who was kind of, his idea is what stemmed this work and this Nobel Prize and this groundbreaking research. He unfortunately died in 1990. And... Nobel prizes are only giving out they're only given out to living people unfortunately so I mean I think he should be kind of posthumously awarded a Nobel prize but that's my personal opinion and even in 1990 he was actually nominated that year for the Nobel prize but died before they could decide who got it or awarded it so if he was alive today, there'd be four people receiving it. He'd be the theorist and then the three experimentalists that proved it. So, kind of to summarize, God doesn't play dice, like Einstein thought. The universe seems to be fundamentally probabilistic. Um, this was thanks to Bell and these three Nobel Prize winners. And this is probably one of the bigger discoveries that'll happen in, in our modern world and will probably lead to a lot of quantum computing stuff and other kind of fundamental quantum mechanics research, I think. Well, I think you say the opposite of what you meant. I think you say, now you say God plays dice because, you know, it's probabilistic oh, yeah. now. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, should, I probably didn't like that. But, you know, maybe it's not playing dice because to me, probability is is pretty, pretty good um, description of things, you know, like, I see nothing wrong with knowing just a probability. Maybe yeah. I'm just too much into physics stuff. Like, oh, if I just know the wave function, it's fine. I don't need to know, you know, the, where it is exactly. If I know the probability of where the region should be, like the electron clouds, right? We don't want to know where exactly electrons are. We want to know what's the probabilistic cloud of interactions. Yeah, and this this probabilistic nature allows us to exist, right? Like you think of electrons orbiting an a an atom, like classically they fall in, but because of this quantum mechanical nature, they're allowed to orbit it, and because of that, atoms exist and we exist. Yeah, but we we've also been brought up on quantum mechanics, I guess. Whereas back in the day, you know, quantum mechanics was a new thing, and I think most assists assumed everything was deterministic so it, it makes sense why a lot of people didn't like it but it's the way it is and you can't change that nature is nature same thing with like curved space time right people want to reject what challenge they believe this has happened with you know the, the spherical earth and <laughs> all the other things right it's, it's hard to change the way you think 
even for us, like when you first learn quantum mechanics, you have to adjust a lot. But then you learn GR, you have to adjust a lot. And now I know what's going to happen with the quantum gravity. And then we're going to have to adjust our thinking again. I know like maybe a decade or two before, like when string theory was at its peak, you know, there was a lot of shift in paradigm in what people think as the fundamental uh, theory of the universe. We all just strings and whatnot. You know, people t- really believed it at the time, right? But now it's like, oh, it's just a kind of a failed theory. But, but I think it's good to recognize that our method of thinking can change just by this new creative idea and theories. Uh, I think another thing to add here is that it's also important that you can test your theories. So in the, in the case of string theory, for example, we would need, I forget the exact number, but a particle accelerator on the order of the size of, I think it's either the solar system or the galaxy, different orders of magnitude, but we need something almost impossibly big to create the energies needed to probe the depths of string theory. And so that's partly why it's not valid is because we can't test it. And that's also why it's so important for experimentalists also to receive this prize, not just theorists, because you need to be able to prove that your theory works or that theories produced by other people work. And I think that highlights the usefulness of different theories and why there are paradigm shifts, because some you just can't test. So you'll never know if it's right or not. Whereas in this case, we know that, yes, we can actually test it. Yes, it's correct. Yeah, I think... You know, string theory is a beautiful, amazing theory, but it's failed to act as a scientific theory because science, as as we know it, has to be able to do experiments on to prove it. You know, do it three times. Do we have the same results? And does happen to cosmology too. Like I say, cosmology is not a physical science because you can't test it physically. Why? Because it's a theory about how universe works how universe was formed, and we only have one universe that we see. Uh, if you create new universe with their rules, we can test it. They're like, oh, the universe works. We're playing God. But no, it's not what we can do right now. So if, so if you figure out a way to test something in cosmology, is it no longer cosmology? Because now it's a science because you can test it. Not necessarily the universe being born. I don't know if we'll ever test that, but other things. I thought you were going to say, like, oh, we can test cosmology. We are basically gods. <laughs> I was like, let's test uh, the beginning of the universe. Let's test the Big Bang. Let's create another Big Bang. I was like, well, if we can create that, <laughs> we just create another universe. A big topic in cosmology is trying to get detectable signals from black holes and things that could tell you about the inside of them. That's what I'm thinking of. I'm not so much thinking about going backwards in time or that kind of stuff but a lot of cosmology is trying to i guess make it not cosmology so that you can get something testable yeah it's certainly there are testable aspects of it and maybe we should do a cosmology episode because we happen to know a couple people who work in cosmology but there are some aspects of the mathematics that do fall out and allow for experimentation or at the very least observation of diff- different aspects of cosmology. Uh, the one that kind of pops to mind, which is kind of half astronomy, half cosmology, is the uh, LIGO Observatory, uh, which detects gravitational waves, which can then be used to prove different uh, cosmological models. Like the cosmic microwave background, too, I think, right? That's kind of a. I- I'm not quite sure what to call it, but I feel like it's a cosmological prediction that involves the big bang and whatnot yeah the cosmic microwave background is certainly a good way to look into the past at what happened around the time of the big bang because it's essentially just remnants of the light that was present in the time of the initial expansion of the universe so to get back into the quantum stuff a little bit we digress a little but the the principle of quantum, quantum mechanics, as we learned it, was, at least to me, very mathematical. I learned quantum with 
like I cannot learn quantum conceptually without the math. It just not how my brain works. Like because I hear these analogies and all these examples since I was younger, I couldn't understand it, especially the paradoxes. But when you actually solve it with math, it actually becomes clear, especially things regarding wave function, probability, measurement. Because if you actually you do the math, it's, it's like it just comes out. It's like, oh, it's like this, and you can prove it. What about the, what if the scenario is a little different? Then you just put it in the equation, and it also comes out nicely. But when you try to think of it as intuition, it takes a while, and it's hard to leap from reading, reading the results or, or what happened and give an understanding of it in your head. I think math, math in a way in quantum is an interface to understand the effects or the phenomena and tra uh, transform it into understanding true math. I think that's what happened to a lot in science, especially in physics. And when the idea is as complicated as quantum mechanics or even general, general relativity, it's nice to have this mathematical interface. Because I think when we understand things as a man, as a human, right? Like you, you look at things and you form connections between you know, different elements in those things. And like, oh, I understand it. This is how it works. This is how photons work. Ah, easy. But quantum is like, well, I don't really know how that works. I can wrap my mind around it. And to me, like Bell and all these people came up with theory to help us understand it way, way better than we ever could just from looking at the experimental results. Yeah, one problem with quantum mechanics is that when it first kind of, I don't, oh, I don't want to say was released when it came out, you know, uh, who was it? It was Feynman, I think, who said, shut up and calculate. Everyone was arguing, what does this mean? Um, and then Feynman said, well, we can figure that out later. For now, let's just see if it works. And it does. The math, like it, Everything comes from the math, and it works super well. But it, it, we're at this point now, and that's what Bell was looking into, was what is this telling us? And there's all these different theories. We still don't have an agreed upon one, like the many worlds theory, and yeah, Copenhagen interpretation and pilot wave theory and stuff like that. There's a whole bunch of them and, you know, they all do the, well, maybe not, they don't all work super well. Copenhagen works very well. Many Worlds, I think, is elegant, but it, I don't like it. It's because I don't like that idea, but it, it's cool. Yeah, my favorite is the single electron th <laughs> <laughs> oh, theory. No. Oh, no. Oh, no. Can I you gotta say it is um you know how we think of electrons has orbitals is multiple electrons in one atom but i don't think we ever observe two electrons at the same time you know it's, it's, it's hard it's really hard and what if there is this one electron in the universe that keep popping up every time you measure it just going everywhere just you know just one electron so that's kind of funny hypothesis that it's like it's fun to mention from time to time i i hate it so much but i remember i looked into it a little bit and i i was like oh this is actually kind of neat like i do not believe it but I, I i could believe it if you convinced me if you it's convincing it's a convincing yeah, argument it's pretty it's like the electron like pops in and out at different points in space time or something but anyway like I guess it could pop in, it could exist at two places in once, maybe? Like, that doesn't make sense to me. Uh, I mean, it kind of can, because part of that theory, I believe, states that it goes backwards and forwards in time. So when it's going backwards in time, it's a positron, which is like an anti-electron. And then when it's going forwards in time, it's an electron. So you account for both all positrons and all electrons, and it can be in the same place at the same time, I think, because it's going backwards and forwards in time. This electron is a god. <laughs> anyway, maybe we should. Maybe we should stop talking about crackpot one electron theories. I, I say crackpot, I mean, I think it actually has a decent mathematical background. But anyway, we should move on to our, uh, our story, I believe. Just to summarize it up a little bit. We, humans, we came up with 
a lot, a lot of theories, and some of them are pretty nut jobs. But it also shows our creativity of it, right? And we, sh- I think we chose to, we choose to believe the theory we we think that makes the world make most sense, or the most beautiful, or the world we want to live in. Right? I don't want to live in the world with one electron, in in what with one electron, right? So there are theory that we chose to believe because you know it's just a great theory. It makes the world such a great place, and something sometimes it's like that. Yeah, when when quantum mechanics and general relativity first were proposed, many people said those are crackpot theories. Those are dumb. But here we are. So, who's to say there isn't one electron? Yes. So that goes to um, our story, which is come on the history of the Nobel Prize. Because if we want to believe the world is a nice and pretty place, maybe we should award some people who make contributions to the world something. All right, and take it away. Well, before we get into the history of the prize, uh, just I want to tell you a couple ways in which you can contact us and where you can find the podcast. So if you're interested in reaching out to us, with if, whether if you have questions, if you want to be a guest on the show because you have an area of expertise that you want to talk about and spread the word about, you can contact us at gmail.com. So we are at we are hyperthesispodcast at gmail.com. We also have an Instagram at the hyperthesis where you can send us messages. You can get updates about when shows are becoming available, which is every Friday at 9 a.m. Eastern time. And you can like our post and share us. Uh, as for finding us, if you're listening to this, you have found us, but we are on Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, Amazon Music, Spotify. We're based on out of anchor.fm and we can be found essentially wherever you find your podcast so feel free to reach out to us and follow us and give us a subscribe and feel free to give us a rating if your platform allows for that so getting into our story this year this episode we talked a lot about this year's nobel prize in physics but there are a variety of different nobel prizes and they have spanned over a hundred years now, with the first one being awarded, I believe, in 1897. But the question is, where did this prestigious prize come from in the first place? Now, a lot of people think it's the Nobel Prize, like your nobility or it's being awarded by nobility, which it technically is, but instead it's named after someone named Alfred Bernard Noble. Now, Alfred Nobel was born in 1833 in Stockholm, which was previously a part of the United Kingdom of Sweden and Norway. So this was before they split and became separate countries. He was the third son to Emmanuel and Carolina, or Carolina Nobel, uh, both who were pretty impoverished at the time. Now, from a young age, Nobel, Alfred Nobel himself was interested in engineering explosives, which came from his family's background. So his dad attended the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, and his ancestor was actually a famous scientist named Olaus Rudbeck. Uh, Apologies if I mispronounce the name. But this encouraged Nobel to explore the world that he lived in and think about how it works and how different things work. His father in particular was a driving force behind his interest, And his father actually moved to St. Petersburg in Russia, where he found success as a manufacturer of machines and explosives. Some of his successful inventions include a veneer lathe, which essentially paved the way for plywood to be produced, as well as work on torpedoes, because this was the 1800s, there wasn't really a lot of different types of ocean warfare aside from cannons and uh, boarding different ships. So from his father's success, Alfred Nobel and his family moved to Russia and started to attend sessions with private tutors. And from there, he started to really excel in his studies. He became fluent in five other languages apart from his native Swedish, uh, which just went on to show the breadth of his knowledge. He also started writing poetry, uh, especially in English, which 
is actually pretty decent if you uh, are able to find it and read it. Now, he was definitely a brilliant child and young adult and was able to receive his first patent at the age of 24. And he used this knowledge and intellect to make many great strides in especially chemistry. One of his most well-known inventions that still used to this day is dynamite. Now, dynamite is a form of nitroglycerin, which is a very unstable and explosive chemical. But Noble had the idea to place this unstable nitroglycerin into an un inert substance that will make it easier to handle and to uh, less explosive, essentially, by accident. So dynamite, which was his invention, was actually derived from the Greek word for power, and it was patented in 1967. So at the time, he was 34 years old. Now, he later improved his invention and continued his work with chemistry and explosives, and produced an even more stable gelatin substance that was also explosive. And the benefit was of this was that it could be fit essentially into any hole uh, that's either drilled or just naturally occurring, which is excellent for mining, especially underground. So you don't need to try and deal with this dynamite, which still wasn't the most stable thing, and had this more stable material, which was just a jelly. Now, the success of, in particular, his gelatin explosive led to a lot of success. However, he didn't do so well mentally uh, with that success. Now, some of his inventions, or most of his inventions, related to explosives and different types of fuel types, uh, some of which are still actually used today, uh, such as a rocket propellant that he invented. Now, these inventions were explosives. They were originally intended to be used for mining. However, a lot of applications were instead focused on weaponry and in war. And this gave Nobel not the best name, because although he had good intentions with his inventions, they were not used for good things. Now, there are some myths surrounding Nobel, especially around the time of his death, and why he decided to create the Nobel Prize in the first place. One of these myths, which has yet gone unproven, but which is fun to tell, is that during the death of his brothers, there was a mistake in a lot of newspapers, and they thought that Alfred himself had died. So they printed his obituary, and some of them were not very kind to his inventions, and what he did during his life. One French newspaper even went so far as to have the title of the obituary claim that the merchant of death is dead. The merchant of death being Alfred Noble himself. And that expanded on the use of his explosives in wartime and as weapons, and stated that Alfred Noble had led to the death of many more people than if he hadn't invented his explosives. Well, this may not be true. Alfred still did decide to dedicate a large portion of his wealth to establish the Nobel Prizes in Sweden. So about 94% of his total assets went to the Nobel Prize Foundation in, after his death in 1896. Now, 94% of total assets for the average person is a decent amount, but probably not a lot. In today's money, he would have donated almost $360 million Canadian. Now that's accrued interest and is worth a lot more today, which is why the Nobel Foundation continues to be so successful and so revered. And in his will, he decided to create five different Nobel Prizes. They were for physics, chemistry, medicine or physiology, literary work, and peace prize. And these have all been awarded almost yearly. There have been a couple interruptions, but uh, essentially this institution has gone on since its inception. Now, the first Nobel Prizes for physics were awarded to Röntgen uh, for the discovery of X-rays and Leonard's for his work with cathode rays. In chemistry, uh, Van Toff, um, unfortunately I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but he won the 
prize for contributions to classical thermal dynamics, which we tend to see as more physics related nowadays, but it was very important in chemistry as well. Uh, for medicine, it went to von Behring for finding a cure to diphtheria, uh, which came in the form of a type of antitoxin. And for the Peace Prize, uh, it went to Dinet for initiating the Geneva Convention and also to Passé, who founded the Peace League. Um, the, Ge Gene the Geneva Convention, of which was definitely prevalent, especially in the World Wars. The Literature Prize went to Prudhomme, which was widely criticized, with people saying that uh, he was, in fact, a mediocre author. However, the criteria the criteria that Nobel laid out for the Literature Prize was not quite exact. So the selection for the first few Literature Prizes were definitely controversial. Now you may be wondering, oh, well, I know there are six Nobel Prizes. What about the Economics Prize? This wasn't actually established until 1968 uh, by Sweden Central Bank. They made a large donation to the Nobel Foundation and established the Nobel Prize in Economics. Now, after this, the Nobel Committee said, nope, that's it. We are no longer inventing any new Nobel Prizes. But today we have six Nobel Prizes, uh, which are still awarded every year. They accept nominations in September of the year prior to the announcement. And usually those nomination forms are sent to about 3,000 people. From there, uh, people send in their nominations, then it goes through a selection process, and the Nobel Prizes are announced later the next year, which we've just recently seen with the different physics, chemistry, uh, and other prizes that have been announced. But it's interesting to think that these Nobel Prizes have been sourced from someone who grew up in poverty before his family found success, and then essentially spent his life doing science and experiments in chemistry, working with explosives, which have not had the best consequences for the world, but which have also led to a lot of human development. And then finally, creating these prizes that are the top tier in the world. Um, and I just remember one thing that a previous Nobel Prize winner, Art MacDonald, who won the 2015 Nobel Prize in Physics, said, um, and it's almost an unfortunate thing about the Nobel Prize is that, to paraphrase, to paraphrase, once you win the Nobel Prize, no one else wants to give you an award since you've already reached the top. Yeah, that was, I, mean, I was reading up on Nobel. In his will, it was, people thought it was ridiculous because he wanted the, the king to give out the award and all these stuff. So people were like, why? Like, you know, he wasn't as... Um, it was pretty notorious because of, of his military business, right? His war business. Yeah, but it came, it came out good in the end. So anyways, thank you, Patrick, for the story for today. I think we have pretty good time. I hope the audience at least have some better understanding on quantum mechanics and entanglement, even though we, we may use a lot of technical stuff. Anyways, it has been great. I'll see you guys next week, and thanks for listening. Bye, everyone. See you.